gosh, look at the crowd. Come this way. Those who spread goodness radiate happiness to everyone around them. Introducing LOLC Finance Credit Cards. Fuel the goodness in you. This is LMD TV. I'm Fazbin Amamadeen. With us tonight is Shehara De Silva. Hello, Shehara. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. In big picture terms, how is the food sector tiding over the economic crisis? Oh gosh, it's quite dystopian and scary at many levels. Um, so I'm first going to uh, answer the question more from a kind of uh, macroeconomic from a national point of view, rather than from the particular group I come from or where we are. You see, part of the problem is that we, uh, the structural issues, government is quite heavily involved in, in food procurement. Uh, uh, and uh, in policy making. So you have an issue where that has totally broken down. It's broken down globally too because of all sorts of externalities. But the, the, the figures are scary because you're talking of something like 6.3 million people uh, being affected or food insecure. Uh, that's, that's about 30% of the, the country. You're talking of possibly I, I'm quoting figures from the World Food Program and, and from FAO on Sri Lanka. You're talking of possibly 65,000 people in a starvation at extreme, extreme poverty. And you're talking of uh, uh, possibly around 2 million or more uh, who are below the poverty line. And poverty line now, because we are uh, you know, sort of, uh, we are no longer an LDC, it was at $60 or something. Uh, uh, month. It's now uh, it's hundred dollars. So it's about forty thousand bucks. People who earn less than that, right? Okay. Uh, so you have a, a major, major humanitarian crisis in Sri Lanka, and frankly, in about forty-five other countries in the world. So we can't we can't pop the whole thing on the uh, you know total uh, maladministration of the Rajpaksa era or anything like that. It's a little more complex than that, much as I don't like them. I think it goes beyond that. Uh, so you're, you're finding that four out of five households have apparently uh, taken strategies to limit their food consumption by doing things like they might just dish less, you know, it's like those of us who over consume and decide to diet, we tend to, you know, somebody's told us that maybe if you have a smaller plate or something, but this is out of necessity, right? So people are to some extent uh, doing that apparently according to research. And uh, other is that they're cutting back a meal. So if you had three, you're doing two, and if you had two, you're doing one. Uh, and Across the board, there is, uh, there is a reduction in the consumption of eggs and proteins and chicken and you know, meat and all because the, the price structure has been such that it's 200, 300% increases. Yeah. Uh, on the plus side, there are big corporates like the group I work for, John Key's group. And, uh, we, we've got the capacity to hold out. So we, we've raised prices and we found some elasticity in price. But we've also had uh, quite a significant hit on our margins, but we've decided to do that rather than pass it all on to a consumer. We are conscious of it. Uh, there is aid coming in. The companies, because they have, you know, they have some resilience, they have cash in hand, they're, they're staying in play. You're finding the smaller guys are falling out and closing down. 
uh, there's huge disruption to the supply chain because of fuel, because of uh, cost of fuel. Um, and uh, honestly, the, 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 the another big issue in the category we are in, because we are in process meets and stuff like that, is that the, 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 the cold chain has gone to a great extent. So the, the, the Podikadik areas are not really uh, willing to, they have the power cuts for a start, and then because of the cost of electricity, they're not running their freezers and fridges. So in short, it's a it's it's not coping well at all. We're in a very serious situation. Uh, and uh, we really, really have to, we should have learned globally. I mean, the UN should have known better. The, the, the world system should have known better. We said this with the pandemic that we should have prepared ourselves. We should have had a greater emphasis on food security at a national and an international level. As far as food supply goes, where are the red flags going forward? So yeah, I, I answered a bit of it in my earlier question too, but I would say so the fuel scarcity is, is, uh, is and the fuel pricing has totally disrupted supply chains on the one hand. Uh, externalities, which is, and I, I think we'll discuss it later in more detail, but the whole uh, uh, you know, predominance of the Ukraine-Russia thing towards the food, uh, food category has impacted quite a bit again on inflationary pricing. Energy costs have also affected food chains, uh, coal chains. So to that extent, I think even the pharma industry, there would be implications, I think, for injection and other things. Uh, but in the food sector, it has impacted. Then at a policy level, the red flag is the fact that we've had a totally, um, you know, very myopic way in which we've done uh, what we call SCLs, or the special commodity levies. So uh, we have sort of crops, which for agronomic reasons, we don't seem to be able to grow well in Sri Lanka. So take the paripu or the dars, we, we don't seem to be able to really grow it. Uh, but we've got these special levies on these sort of things without understanding that we should have, you know, prioritize a few nutritional foods and make sure we get it in. And procurement is so corrupt and so compromised. And, uh, and uh, I guess we haven't had cash. There are issues there. Uh, so uh, those are some of the main things. Dairy was another product that has been highly. So there's eggs. Then you have we had we had some capability of being self-sufficient in, and we were kind of before. Uh, and I think historically we've had one good um, policy of we never let people sell their, their, their computers, you know, the other uh, paddy lands were not allowed to be sold to do anything else in. So the conversion of, from paddy lands has been less. Uh, and we seem to have, it's one of the few agricultural products where seed technology seems kind of okay now, at least we were able to get almost self-sufficient. Uh, well, so it's it's a red flag if you don't manage it because that, that that's one thing at least we might be able to uh, to handle without being over optimistic. Everything else we'll have to take a long shot, even if we say you know we are going to suddenly go into modern agriculture or anything else. Um, maybe I would flag one other thing as as a, as a red flag. Uh, Twenty two percent of our caloric consumption comes from imports. So there is a big red flag in the fact that we've had to freeze a lot of imports uh, because we ha don't have the dollars, right? So it's a chicken and egg, uh, pun intended, but uh, what do you do? But at the same time, then you're having a huge uh, drop in, uh, in the protein consumption and calorie consumption, which is why I, I tend to believe that the, the figures uh, by the UN may be right. I think all the figures we get at a national level from my, my experience of working with government and we're seeing this sometimes even the central bank saying, oh, you know, we got the numbers wrong and we put it in a wrong bucket. I think a lot of the numbers are suspect. Uh, but saying that it's, it's an indicative number and I think it's indicating a very grim situation. 
Inflation and food inflation continuing to rise. Is the retail sector capable of playing a part in mitigating the hardships that people are facing? And if so, how? So, President, one of the issues is, you know, retail sector is a very broad term. Huh? So you have, uh, you have retail sector contributing to something like, uh, uh, they say almost, uh, you know, it's, it's 13 billion or something to the economy, right? Uh, and it's, It's quite large, it goes through any goods and services, but let's look at it particularly from the food retail sector for, for the particular conversation we're having. Otherwise, you have to take the tourism services sector, Airbnbs, restaurants, uh, uh, banking services, ICT, a lot more goes into retail. Um, I think the, the issue is that it's given us all a wake up call and the bigger players, I certainly know that uh, within even the John Keyes group, there is a serious uh, attempt to look at how we get more nutritional things. We're talking to more nutritionists. We are trying to pivot in terms of contributing a little more uh, to the need of the R uh, because we've been in different categories, right? We are in carbonated drinks, we're in ice creams and stuff like that. And then we are in sausages and you know, not, not necessarily that nutritional food. So there has been a shift towards soya. There is a, there is a greater interest in trying to research and bring in uh, and keep price points low and take some of the margin hit. So you will see some mergers and acquisitions and you will see uh, some of the bigger players trying to trying to help. God willing also there will be aid coming in. Uh, and I see uh, the private sector perhaps playing a role in that instead of government, it might be good. So we need about 2 million metric tons of rice and that's about 4 million metric tons of paddy if you had to do it ourselves. Uh, but perhaps in some degree of uh, the, the donors are pledging to feed about a hundred, uh, about a million pregnant women and about another million uh, needy people. So somewhere in this, we, we have to partner them on the disbursements because government disbursement is is also so politicized that I think the wrong people are getting what has to be given as handouts. There'll have to be era or necessary handouts, but we have to somehow watchdog it. I, I'm not too sure uh, we have the capability fully, unless we agree, like at one time, uh, the care biscuit was done by Manshi, uh, which was a kind of three Porsche thing. There may be an opportunity for the big distributors in food to, to in some way uh, participate in that. And I think they will. They won't be able to solve the problem, but they might be able to mitigate some of the impacts. What implications are there for the sector from the interim budget? Interim budget, with all fairness, you know, it's a very IMF friendly budget. And uh, we could not have expected much, right? It, it's kind of, uh, you can't say, have you saved the patient, all that's happened is you've stopped, you're trying to stop a bleed, a bleeding wound, right? Uh, you haven't uh, cured anything and you can't. Uh, even if you ask me later uh, about the next budget, I doubt that we would be able to do anything that's that's dramatic because we are working with uh, with a very, very volatile situation. So the, the, the interim budget is, of course, because of that, there was a 3% increase, and that was on top of a previous uh, set of measures increasing taxes, which I think is necessary, but it means pricing has gone up, right? And there hasn't been enough of thought related to having a kind of absolute essential list of, of uh, goods. Um, and then we've had the, the previous folly of the totally unconscionable sugar, sugar scam and stuff like that, uh, which as much as the tax, uh, you know, when they took off the personal tax and, and waved that off, the sugar scam is as horrendous. So I, I fear that if there are a couple of major things to, you know, raise or lower taxes on certain things that they may lower the wrong things because of, I don't know, a multinational lobby or some other thing, or you know, somebody's vested interest rather than the, the interest of the public and the citizenry at large. Does the focus on agriculture in the interim budget go far enough? What more can be done to boost this sector? 
That's, that's, that's the million dollar question, right? We have failed. We have failed. And I, I hate to bring this thing of, you know, we've always talked about 2005, 100 years of civilization, but we pioneered some of the notions of non-food security to the water management in terms of being that so-called granary of bees. In a different era than Northern province, people might tell you that during Mrs. Banda's time, actually uh, import restriction helped the agricultural sector substantially. Somewhere between, you know, it's like some of these intellectuals, Padini is a classic example. I mean, he's not a real intellectual, but he was to some extent an educated man and he's fully related to his recommendations on the fertilizer, which is, you know, cascaded into a whole lot of issues related to already limited yields. We have never done enough related to seed technology and stuff like that. So, so, Unless we, we and, and if you talk internationally and you talk to certain blocks with people in Asia and, and you know, in our part of the world, there is also some para paranoia that between the World Trade Organization and patents and rights and, and even seed technology that there is, you know, so to unravel it in a quick and fast way, it may not be, you know, by the time you get to 10, 10 experts together, will be arguing about uh, you know, what this seed will do to the water table and that seed will do to this and stuff like that. So our dairy industry, for example, I know personally, because I was a Fontel marketing director of uh, Anchor Fontel And subsequently, a couple of times I worked with uh, experts, international experts coming down to look at our dairy industry. Uh, we are using the wrong grass, right? But then when you ask the agricultural experts, they say you can't bring these other grasses down because it will impact on our you know, water tables and this and that. They're the experts, right? So all I know is that ultimately we can't get the right yields and therefore it's not productive and all these sort of things. So, so there has to be some midpoint and we don't have the time on our sides if for so long we haven't got it right. But uh, just one other comment is that we haven't modernized agriculture in any sense, right? So I would say other than a company like um, uh, CIC, right, <laughs> initially in paints, but they've, they've done some really good work in terms of modern agricultural practice. Uh, Haley's uh, going back in time and the larger Sundra did something with uh, HECAB and found a niche which was unique and stuff like that. but. Uh, really, we are we are non-players in every sense of the word, and it's a you know people don't want to work in the sector. The, the, the income of it is not right. We haven't understood how to do a, you know multi-cropping to be able to buffer against seasonality and, and crop loss. And we have a very predatory banking system where we've also lost out in having DFIs. We don't have any who are in some way supposed to look at how you, you build enterprise and sectors and categories, giving say 15 year, 15 year loan schemes for equipment and stuff like that. Again, these are all things that I don't think that can be fixed in the short term because these are, these are going to take time if you are going to do structural changes or, or rethink some of these things. Uh, and do you have any expectations of the forthcoming budget of, for 2023? So, yeah, so I think it's tough on anyone, but say if I had a magic wand or I had the power and I was, I had the year of uh, what I feel is a fairly uh, non-responsive government even this time around at some level to the, the major priority needs. And they've got to gonna get their head because they also have to, you know, pander to uh, totally compromised parliament and, uh, you know, they, they've, they are having issues related to mismanaging human rights issues and all sorts of things. So uh, the eyes off the ball and they're trying to do quick fix stuff. So to me, it's appalling that, not that I'm a Puritan, I have no issues. I think it's good that they're going into casinos at some level, but, uh, you know, between casinos and legalizing pot. I think we could do better than that in terms of what we do, uh, the, uh, you know, immediate policy solutions that we're rolling out. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I would say if, if I was doing, I'd really focus on fisheries. 
uh, 40% of the, the uh, protein value of our country is consumed from fish. Again, we have the seas around us. Uh, we haven't spent enough on the sector. We don't have the right loan structures. You ask anyone whether they're giving leases for boats or anything else, you know, we need to get some bigger boats out to slightly deeper seas. Uh, we've lost some of the cold storage stuff that was out there in the north. There's a lot of this 40% of anyway, the produce comes from the north, right? So there are things that we could do and we should do, and there should be enabling policy because those are again, low hanging fruits to kind of fix because there is, <laughs> there is fish in the sea. We don't have to say, you know, have you got the right variety have with this we have to somehow get it we have to store it we have to export and not export money and we have to feed our people with it right so it's possible with a lot of emphasis and money thrown at it through the banking sector which they are not doing none of them are lending to the sector how is the migration of labor affecting the food sector at this time the short answer is i don't really know but I'm going to just give you your kind of guesstimate in terms of things that the retail sector particularly is is uh, is uh, not being paid adequately. So you know it's not a it's not a living wage. The mom and pop stores are what we call the silaracada, by and large unpaid family labor, right? And they're reeling anyway. There is a sort of credit cash crunch anyway, right? So now everyone, even the patricians, are now saying. You know, even credit card you have to pay because the next Bowser in turn has to be paid. So everybody's trying to uh, run on real time money, but it's difficult, right? And because all these are informal sector, right? The bulk of it is all, we have about 150,000 to 200,000 retail outlets, right? And most of them don't come and you don't even have that many taxpayers uh, because the system has made it so difficult and the system is not giving any value addition or any kind of safety net. So why come into it and just have people breathing down on your throat in any way? Um, I think the, main issue should be in some way that we, we we find a way to make people stay on in the country at the moment i know because we are desperate for it we're just trying to push labor out and, and well and good because they can do but it disrupts family right uh, so at that larger sort of sociological level i'm i'm always pained and it's something i've been very vocal about at the gender level that the three biggest employers of women for a start uh our uh, garment industry, the migrant labor industry, and the plantation sector. Uh, and all three of them are, are sectors that actually destroy family. Garment boys will be upset if I say that they do it too, but because they bring them into a city and it's, you know, and they keep them for five years, they don't have housing to, to bring partners and marry and have kids. They have to go back for that. And then they sort of drop out of the workforce because they're biological flaw. In. But this is outside the mandate of our current conversation. The women then are also in, uh, in agriculture, they're saying about 25% of the workforce are women in agriculture, and they're all, again, unpaid family labor. So, you know, you work and you don't get recognized, it's off the books. Uh, so it's very difficult to maintain like that. It's an exploitative thing. The man gets something, woman rarely gets anything out of it. What is your take of the global food supply chain in the wake of the war in Ukraine? Well, the, the biggest problem has been that there's been, uh, again, a dominance uh, for, for the Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine and Russia dominate. It's apparently something as a 28%, almost a third of the global uh, trade in food is coming from these two countries, which is ridiculous. 70% of the sunflower production is coming from there. And 30% uh, of the, uh, the purchases of uh, wheat uh, for the UN are coming from there. So it's a big hit. It's a big hit. Our own market, we are finding the biscuit guys, we are finding it. We can't do uh, you know, a lot of things because we don't have wheat. Uh, so, and then that means the guys, especially companies like Ceylon Biscuits and all can't therefore export as well, or there are, there are issues there. 
uh, because we can't get the wheat or the price has gone up so much because uh, there is such a shortage now. On top of that, Indonesia uh, stopped the export of uh, palm oil. So it was a double when we didn't have sunflower oil and then you're not having wheat. So yeah, the, the repercussions uh, have been very high. 40% uh, of the caloric intake comes from three crops in the world, wheat, corn, and rice, and they're concentrated in a few regions. So between the, the, the war in Ukraine, these have amplified the, the issue that we have not uh, prioritized food security. And it's sad, you know, I, I, I went on a holiday once to uh, Switzerland, but I was looking at, they, they have apparently go-downs of chocolate in case the world has a nuclear closure. And they have two, three years of stock of chocolates because they think that's important. The Swiss, Swiss are always forward thinking. But the rest of the world has not done enough. Uh, Peru, which was also very strong in, um, in food security in some ways in the good old days, because they also pioneered some of the ways of uh, uh, preserving food. Uh, uh, by dehydrating it. Uh, so they have one of the world's largest uh, seed farms where, again, if, if the world gets kind of wiped out, they will have enough of seeds of every type to recreate biodiversity on the planet. Uh, we, I know we're a small nation, but we say we are, we are strong in biodiversity, and I think we have done next to nothing in terms of looking at some of these things. Uh, storing of seeds, having anything for a time like this, we don't even, you can't find the seeds to plant anything. As for the state of the nation, where do we stand in your eyes? Where is our country's image heading? Gloomy, dystopian, uh, uh, very worrying. There is hope, there is hope. Uh, and you can see that, that uh, some of the bigger companies are still holding water. It's amazing how, how we are, uh, but there, 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 is, there is resilience in the system. The short-term political risks and the social risks are also worrying uh, because there seems to be almost a deafness within the system related to that. But I won't get into the politics of it, except that I don't think we can have another type of JVP uprising or anything else. We can't have another ethnic thing. I think we'll just implode ourselves. But so law and order and the use of PTA are issues. So these are all for image, right? But as a branding and marketing person, I'm most perturbed uh, about the hodgepodge of signals that are coming out in very, very recent times. If you see the amount of WhatsApp stuff going on about uh, Bally's casinos, <laughs> promotion of, uh, I don't know if you've seen it, but um, many people from the diaspora have been reaching out to me because they know I've been quite passionate about mission branding and saying how upset they are about, one, the objectifying of women, but I mean, basically that, you know, it's it's uh, it's so tasteless to say the least, right? Uh, but on the plus side, there seems to be some some euphoria hope that, that uh, tourism numbers will pick up for the big season this year. Uh, that uh, the whole world is messed up and people will have short-term memories and go away, you know, seeing all these uh, sordid videos on TikTok or whatever you, uh, casinos and, and, you know, almost sort of selling Sri Lanka as a den for, uh, I don't know, casinos and women. Uh, there is more to it. We have a fabulous product. Uh, and there are enough of people who've experientially loved this country and they've just not been able to harness that. So international image is not, an, not a major issue. There's too much going on in the world and every country is messed up trying to figure out, you know, how they sort their bad leadership out. I think the, the challenge will be really to see whether we can get a strong enough government to hold out and make some priorities, sort the the humanitarian crisis related to people starving, manage to take the haircuts we need, and then I think we'll bounce back eventually, God willing. Shara, I appreciate your time and thoughtful perspective you provided on the consequences of the internal and external conflicts and the interim budget on the retail sector as well as the country. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much.
Good night. That's all from us. Good yeah, night. Good night. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for watching and stay safe.